Welcome to an episode of Video Vision. Today we will talk about fusion research and in particular about recent results which you could see in the press release which come from the W7 accelerator experiment located in Greifswald, Germany. And the press release, I have the German version here, it's not important, I will show you slides, figures afterwards. The press release said milestone W7X reaches a milestone and it is eight minutes of plasma operation and it is more than one gigajoule of energy which is put through the machine. And what I want to do in the next 15 minutes or so is I want to explain why is this important, why is it a milestone, what does it mean and what does it mean to run a fusion device in stationary in steady state. And, and to do this I will go back to the basics and explain what a stellarator is. So in fact it, there are tokamaks and stellarators as the magnetic confinement devices for fusion research and in these graphics you will see this. On the left hand side you see the tokamak which we have one here in Garching where I'm sitting now, Garching by München. This is Germany, southern Germany. Um, it's called Astex Upgrade. There is JET in the UK. There is ITER under construction in Kadarash. They are all tokamaks meaning that the plasma, which is this yellow annulus torus in the center of the device, the magnetic field, the magnetic cage of the plasma is made up by the red coils, which provide a toroidally winding field. And then there is a huge plasma current, like one megamp in Astex upgrade, maybe three megamps in jet, which is driven by a transformer. This is the solenoid, the pink solenoid in the center. It means that it's a sort of simple device because you have planar coils. On the other hand, it is usually pulsed because if you have to drive the current in the plasma by the transformer action, the transformer current, the primary current in the transformer changes all the time. So after some time you will have to stop the pulse. On the other hand, on the right hand side, you see the Stellarator. The Stellarator, this is now W7X, Wendelstein 7X in Germany, in the north of Germany, near the Baltic Sea, Greifswald. And in this device, both components, toroidal and poloidal magnetic field, are generated by external coils. There is no plasma current. There is no need to drive a plasma current. You can see that because of this, the coils look much more complex. The, these blue guys, which are the coils, are actually 3D objects. But then on the other hand, since there is no need to drive a current, it is stationary. So you have a simpler device, but it is pulsed. You have the stationary device, inherently stationary device, W7X. And the W7X device, I will show quickly. This is the plasma, which you could see in the slide before already, which was optimized according to seven different criteria, amongst them, for example, the energy confinement and also the stability against pressure-driven instabilities. You need to put a coil system. In W7X, this coil system is superconducting. So there is another part of the coils added to this such that we can play around with the configuration of the magnetic field. Since they are superconducting, well, first of all, you have to put you have to put this onto a support structure and put feeders and stuff. You also have to put a cryostat around it. And in the end, you only see the cryostat from the outside. And the, it means that the, Coils are cooled down to minus 270 degrees C, like 4 point something Kelvin, because it's helium, which is the coolant in there. Then the coils are superconducting, the current flows with no electrical resistance, which also means you can exploit fully the steady state conditions of the stellarator. So this is the experiment, how it was built up and then taken into operation in 2015 with helium plasmas and 2016 with hydrogen plasmas. And since then we operated the experiment for four years until 2019. And in fact we reached some really nice results, which I will show you a glimpse of in a second. But before, let me say one thing which is important. W7X at that time, in the last period, was what is called inertially cooled, meaning that the first wall of the device which is the component that sees the plasma made up of heat shield tiles. This was inertially cooled. What does it mean inertial cooling? Well, inertial cooling means that you have heat impinging on a surface. The surface heats up, 
so does the whole tile. And inertially cooled means that the, the surface temperature keeps climbing, so does the temperature of the tile. But if you have a very large block, which you heat up, you have quite some heat capacity, quite some inertia for heating. And this means that for a certain time, you can just put heat into it and see how the temperature rises. If you stay below the melting temperature, it's not a problem. So this is why the tiles would usually look something like this. So this is a structure, simple block, if you like. And if you have the plasma, for example, sitting here and there is heat coming by radiation and by particles along the magnetic field lines, you would heat this up. And it is clear that if you want to do this, in fact, you want to have a really large chunk of material with a high heat capacity. So it just heats up. And then at some point you reach the temperature, the maximum allowable temperature at the surface, and then you stop the experiment. And then there is maybe a cooling pipe somewhere down here through which you flow water and that removes the heat on a longer time scale after you have done the experiment. So that enabled us to do experiments on short pulses and some of the results you can see here. One thing is this is the magnetic field in vacuum. These are magnetic field lines visualized by electrons which run along the magnetic field lines and then they go into contact with the fluorescent material which gives these very nice pictures here. And so you see actually individual magnetic field lines and they line up pretty much very precisely the way they were designed to do. So they have very well defined magnetic surfaces. We can tell from this picture that the precision is very high in, even in this large apparatus W7X with 10 meters of diameter. There is a precision on a millimeter level in terms of positioning the coils. So that's pretty nice. And then if you start the plasma, what you will see is that if you look at the so-called triple product, this is density times temperature times energy confinement time. This is what measures the success of a fusion experiment. In fact, you can see up here the lines break even when you would have as much heat generated by fusion as you put in or even ignition up here in the green line. And stellarators were nowhere on this diagram. Then there is the LHD in Japan and now W7X, which broke a record already. And the red point here, which is pretty much high up, is what was done in the period up to 2019. However, keep in mind it was done in short pulse because this is what I said before. Due to the inertial cooling, you could only do this in short pulse. Now on the next slide, you actually see a very nice experiment which tries to exploit the steady state, the long pulse capability. So this is operation of the W7X plasma. That's a function of time. You can see the time traces going on. And what you actually see, that's pretty boring because everything becomes stationary. And this is really good because this is what you want. You don't want surprises and excursions and stuff. So we could actually demonstrate for 30 seconds that we could keep the thing stable. We put something like maybe four to five megawatt into the plasma. We had a limit in the total energy which you could inject, which was limited to so something like 75 megajoules. And this is just because still some of the structures heat up because they were inertially cooled and not actively cooled. Now, I said already the machine is now actively cooled, fully actively cooled to extend the parameter space from 2022 on. And this is what we did in these three years. Now, you might ask yourself, why does it take three years in order to replace all of this? Well, this is somehow connected to what I showed here. It is not that you can just change slightly the design of this and then you would come to a stationary component. Rather, you will have to change it quite a bit because remember, you are in steady state. You are no longer in the condition where the inertia of this, the block, the heat capacity takes the heat and the temperature is rising. You want the temperatures to be constant. So there is a certain temperature up here put it red because it's high. So there's a certain temperature up here at the surface maybe and then the temperature decreases down here. So if you have a coolant like water here, you have a difference between the surface temperature and the coolant temperature. And that's basically given by the heat conductivity and by the distance. So the shorter the distance, the lower the difference in temperatures. And actually it turns out if you want to keep this to a manageable temperature at the heat fluxes we are expecting, 
you will have to put your pipe pretty close to the surface. So it's a different concept. Here you rely on the inertia, here you rely on the water which takes away the energy or the power, actually the heat which is deposited in this. And so if you want a manageable difference between cooling water temperature and surface temperature, you have to have a really thin structure. So this is a more fragile structure and very different from the blocks we had in there before. Meaning that we had to take out all of the interior of the vessel, I mean of the first wall components, and replace by actively cooled elements. And this is quite a job, you can imagine, in a machine like W7X. I have some pictures of this here, which I can show. So on the left-hand side of this, you just see the tooling. Actually, this is mainly the tools which are brought into the vacuum vessel in order to do the replacement of this. And then on the right-hand side, you can see how some of this stuff is mounted. There are modules. These are the graphite tiles, which should take the heat then. And you actually see a poor person lying here in the vessel, because, of course, some of the stuff has to be put overhead. So you have to have special tools which keep your components in place. And then remember, you have to install them with very high precision. So this is really a job which took quite a long time. And also, the piping, by the way, on the next slide you see the piping. So the gray stuff is now the water piping which we had to install in the machine, which is a lot. There's actually a cutaway which is similar to what I've shown you before. Now it's the water piping in there and you can imagine that, first of all, installing this, it should all be leak tight, absolutely leak tight, because you run this in vacuum inside the vessel. It has to be leak tight, it has to be connected, it has to be gauged such that the pressure is the same everywhere. And so we were very happy that by middle of 2022 we could recommission the machine, take into operation, and in fact there was no leak and no problem with this at all. And this then actually enabled us to do the experiments. So you look at the interior of the vessel. Well, first of all, you look at the exterior, you see all this piping. At the interior, you now see the actively cold components here. And these were used to do the experiments. And I show you the experiment right away. I have a video on the left-hand side, which is a bit like what I showed before, in the sense that it's boring. And when I say boring, this is still 15, 15 million degree in the center, 1.5 kV. It's the same temperature as in the center of the sun, right? So it's, it's actually pretty hot, but it is very well behaved. That's what I mean by boring, actually. So it's a well-behaved plasma. And the difference to before is that we would have to sit and watch this for eight minutes in order to see the end of the video, which I will not do. Rather, on the right-hand side, you see an infrared picture of the first wall where the most of the energy goes to some of the spots on the first wall. And this is now in fast forward so that you can see within some tens of seconds the whole discharge. So if you look at the right hand side, you see the so-called strike line. This is where the plasma hits the wall light up. You see some hot spots, but you also see that the temperature after some time is no longer climbing. And this is indication we are now really in steady state and everything works just perfectly up to our expectation. In fact, I mentioned 75 giga, sorry, 75 megajoule for the previous configuration as the limit, and now we have reached 1.3 gigajoule already, which actually is more than the milestone we had set for one gigajoule of this. So this is actually a pretty good success. And the question is, like always, will we call this video a breakthrough in nuclear fusion? OK, I think it's not a breakthrough. I, I think a breakthrough is something spectacular, slightly unexpected, which opens doors to something completely new, which you didn't expect before. We expected this, but we expected it would be very tough to reach it. And actually, we, we got there faster than we thought. So this means, I would call it really a milestone. We reach a milestone. We show a new capability of the machine, which now lets us explore things which were not possible to explore before. And it's a big success for technology. I mean, building all this stuff that everything is really cool such that it doesn't overheat and sort of start to glow and you have to stop before. This is really a great success. So what will this do for us? Well, if we look in the future, I think what we mainly plan to do is this here. You can, for the existing experiments, 
plot as a function of the discharge time the triple product. This is this, I had the graph before where you saw n times t times tau, which is the Lawson criterion, which is what you want to reach. So n times t times tau e. And then there is a value, for example, for a fusion reactor where you would say, this is what I want to reach, and I want to reach it in steady state. Now then you can look at what has been reached so far. So take JET, the largest fusion experiment in the world, and look at the record discharge with deuterium and tritium. And it's maybe this value here, it's really arbitrary units on the axis. But you will see that if you look at this performance, and you look at how people did this for a longer time, longer and longer discharges, the curve will look something like this. And if you look on the axis, you will have seconds here and tens of seconds here and then maybe minutes here, but you really want to go for hours and days and maybe even a year if you think of a fusion reactor. And this is due to all the performance limitations that the experiments have had. In the tokamaks, in fact, you, ha you have a problem driving the current. So you also have copper coils you can't go for very long. In fact, the intermediate range is filled by the Japanese Stellarator LHD and the Chinese Tokamak East, where they explored this range, but they couldn't really go in this direction. Everything which is down here has very low plasma performance. So it's really like a more like a light bulb then like a hot plasma where you go for days or hours and this region in between becomes quite interesting to see if you can do this without degradation of the performance so we are expecting that w7x is going somewhere out here which will be unknown territory uncharted and it will be great to see how we go there. And in fact, we are scratching this. I don't show the point that the experiment is actually only two weeks old, so we are still debating exactly about the values, but we are sitting somewhere exactly at this border. So saying that if we increase the heating power, which was 2.7 megawatt at present, we increase to say five megawatt and we go and do this for 10 and then ultimately even half an hour, 30 minutes, we are very sure to reach this new territory where nobody has been before. And this is the great thing that makes us so excited about this now. And I should say Tokamaks will always have a problem to go into this direction because they will have to drive the current in order to do so, different than the transformer, in order to do so they will have to put plasmas of very low density to have high current drive efficiency, so they will always be stuck in this parameter to relatively low values. W7X it doesn't actually care what the density is. It's actually beneficial to have higher density because then exhaust of the power from the plasma becomes simpler. And so we think that this can explore also in terms of individual values of N and T, a large range in here, which is not accessible to tokamaks, including at the high density also the flux of particle to the wall, which is quite interesting for the plasma wall interaction. So I hope this was a bit enlightening to you in order of to understand what this press release really means. And if you find it interesting, if you have questions, you can put questions in the comment section below. We look at these, I try to answer from time to time the comments and the questions in this section. But for today, I say thank you for your attention and goodbye.